Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Tom Kowalski. I am the International Chair of PsychSign. Welcome to the third annual International Online Conference that we're hosting today. Today is a pre-recorded conference with a panel um, because of simply the climate of what's going on in the world. And we know that a lot of our international members are all over the globe from South America to Africa to India and, and China as well. So we wanted to do a pre-recorded conference where everybody can just access the video at their own leisure. So today I'm excited because we have a great group of panelists from all different years of uh, their psychiatry residency training, and we're going to get to their introductions momentarily. But first, let me tell you a little bit about what PsychSign does. So PsychSign is a student interest group run primarily from the United States, where we I uh, have different subgroups from the uh, American Psychiatric Association, and we help create connections between medical students and professionals in the psychiatry field. So we look for creating mentors. We look for creating um, activities for students to do just to further, um, further bring their interest in the field of psychiatry. So how to get involved in, in psych science? Well, you guys are all members right now, but um, additional things that you can do is join our national virtual conference, which is taking place in uh, next month in May. Uh, registration is currently going on, and we're also doing uh, various positions that you can run for. For instance, the international chair like myself, we also have social media chairs, uh, forum mod uh, moderators, different mentorship um, programs or different mentorship positions and we definitely encourage you to go through our website and look at any positions that you may be interested in. So here's a short little breakdown of the psych sign leadership. As you can see, um, APA is kind of our, our uh, head body and then in psych sign we have our president who kind of navigates the uh, special interest groups, the social media chairs and the mentorship uh, positions, like I mentioned. We also have a delegate who works with the American Medical Association on our behalf, and then we also have a president-elect who is going to take over the, the next year, and they kind of monitor um, all of our different region positions uh, along with um, inter international chair positions. <clears throat> so now, without further ado, let me introduce to you our three panelists for this evening. So first we have uh, Dr. Caitlin Fitzgerald. Uh, Dr. Dr. Fitzgerald is a PGY-1 resident in Savannah, Georgia at Gateway Behavioral Health. She attended medical school in, um, at UMHS in St. Kitts. And then we have Dr. Ramit Gill. She is also a PGY-1 resident. She attends um, the psychiatry program at Wake Forest, <coughs> um, Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, um, North Carolina. And she attended also UMHS. And then we have uh, Dr. Fry Morgan. He is a PGY-4 resident who is uh, actually going to be um, joining a fellowship program next year. And I'm sure he'll be able to address that uh, in, this, in this talk today. And he's also at Wake Forest Baptist uh, Medical Center. And then he attended uh, medical school in Cairo University in Egypt. <clears throat> so let's get started with the conference today. So I will stop sharing the screen and okay, perfect. So um, I want to make this kind of as interactive as possible. I would like the, the panelists to kind of just briefly introduce themselves, kind of tell them, tell us a little bit about uh, their journey into psychiatry. And um, just so our audience knows, these are all obviously IMGs, like I mentioned, and that's the, the reason why I wanted to bring them on, it's not only because they're friends of mine, but also because I know I trust their opinions, and then I know that they can uh, help us kind of understand the journey of um, going into psychiatry from, from, a, from an IMG perspective. So uh, Dr. Morgan, do you want to start us off? I do. I had a technical failure, and I was kicked out for about 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> it's all good. So what was, the, what was the first part of the question? So I only heard, you, do you want to start us off? <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to talk to us just a little bit about um, your journey into psychiatry, kind of how it all started, if you can just elaborate on that a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah, the question makes more sense now for me. Um, my interest in psychiatry started, I would say, um, about fifth or sixth year of medical school in Egypt, and um, 
I'm sure folks that watch this that are from the Middle East or at least from Egypt are familiar with that medical system. It's the six years straight out of um, high school. So mm -hmm. by, I want to say by the fifth or sixth year um, in med school, my interest shifted to, um, it started out with psychology and the humanities because um, what was going on in my in the world around me back then in Egypt, that was the time of the Arab Spring and the revolution and all that. So um, I was all about surgical um, specialties, general surgery to begin with, and then I narrowed it down to cardiothoracic surgery. Um, but roughly around, I want to say, 2011, 2012, when I got more involved in social and political issues, my interest shifted towards the humanities and psychology, and it naturally followed that psychiatry became my field of interest. And um, uh, to keep it real, psychiatry in the Middle East is a very, let's say, rudimentary field. It's very atrophied. Mm -hmm. uh, even when, when I look when I look at how things are right now, they are they're still in the psychoanalytical phase of psychiatry that the Western world kind of moved away from probably, I don't know, 50 years ago. Um, I, I remember my psychiatry rotation, so to speak, was exactly two lectures and a 50-page handout. That was the extent of exposure to psychiatry. Um, so that was a big part of my decision to move to the States um, for career purposes, but also there was a lot of the social and political stuff going on. So by the time I was done with med school, it was the natural thing to do was to pursue a career in psychiatry in America. Mm -hmm. Right, and the rest is history. <laughs> and then here we are today. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, thank you for joining us today, um, Dr. Fitzgerald. Do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Dr. Fitzgerald. I'm actually from New Jersey. Uh, my interest started in high school when I took an AP psychology class, and I talked to my professor about what kind of options I have, and uh, he explained the field of psychiatry to me, and I knew like that's where I want to go. So um, I went to university at NYU and majored in psychology there, um, continued my studies afterwards at uh, UMHS St. Kitts with um, Tom and Dr. Gill, uh, kind of solidified that interest as a TA on the island for behavioral sciences, um, took the majority of my electives in psychiatry, and here we are. <laughs> Yes, here we are. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. And then last last but not least, Dr. Gill. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Rumi, and I guess my journey to psychiatry um, really started quite early on. So I'm from Canada. Um, so being an international medical graduate, you know, I think a lot of us come from all different walks of life. And... Um, going to a Caribbean school was never really, you know, something that I had planned for initially, but I actually ended up working out really great because I met, you know, so many wonderful people out there. But going into medical school, um, I, I thought I wanted to be a psychiatrist. So that was like, you know, one of the things that was kind of in the back of my mind going into medical school. And then once I got into medical school, you know, I discovered that I really had a, a love for physiology and working with my hands. So... So I actually went through medical school thinking I was probably going to end up doing um, either a surgical specialty like Dr. Morgan had mentioned, or I was thinking, you know, um, intensive care uh, and pulmonology. But it wasn't until the last rotation of my third year, which is my psychiatry rotation, that it kind of like, you know, reawoke that, that love of um, psychiatry in me. And for me, it really kind of came down to... Um, psychiatry felt like the field in which I could do the most good and it felt like it came the most naturally to me. I felt like my personal strengths and capabilities could be put to the best use in this field and after that, you know, going into my fourth year, I was like, you know, I really should consider psychiatry. Um, I think I, I did two, yeah, no, three different psychiatry electives. I um, also did a bunch of surgery electives, so I hadn't made up my mind yet, but then when it came time, you know, to kind of apply for residency, I, I sat down and I looked at the various different things that, you know, really play into it. And I think it's important to consider not only what you enjoy, but also the type of life you want to live. Um, my husband, actually, was the one who was like, you're not a morning person. You want to go into surgery, you're going to be getting up at like 3 a.m. <laughs> you're going to hate your life. <laughs> 
So, you know, I really had to kind of outweigh the pros and cons, and I ended up applying to sort of, uh, sorry, psychiatry, and I was fortunate enough to, like, match up my number one spot, and I have had no regrets since. So, that's how I ended up awesome. here, and I'm very happy with my decision. Perfect. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you guys for all for sharing kind of just like a little bit of background. I think it helps um, students kind of just see the journeys that we all go on. We're all obviously... Uh, and it's not a cookie cutter kind of way that we, even as IMGs, like we just, like we always navigate the hurdles differently. Um, and it's, it's cool to kind of come together and, and share these, these kinds of stories. So, uh, without further ado, let's kind of just jump into the questions. So the way I kind of want to, um, lay this out is I want to go through the journey of how medical students go through things. So first we'll talk about a little bit about basic sciences and then kind of what activities people do and things like that. And then we'll jump into clinicals and then applying for match, like ERAS, all that stuff. And then ultimately you guys can share your experiences about residency and any plans beyond that. So uh, the first question we kind of have is, um, what activities should medical students do in basic sciences? Um, like what, what, what can they do to, to, to not only develop their interest in psychiatry, but also things that will help them on down the line where it can show that they're a more well-rounded applicant when thinking about ERAS and all of that. So if anybody wants to start off with that, with what kind of activities they kind of did in, in the basic sciences. I guess I can uh, talk about that a little bit since I did uh, TA, a teacher assistant at my medical school. So a um, great opportunity to kind of review the different um, topics that we discussed in the behavioral science class, become more familiar with it, get an opportunity to teach um, and do different lectures. And I know it looked great when I was applying that I had that down. Um, also got a chance to get closer with my professor while I was on island and have a letter of recommendation from him um, for getting different electives. Um, I just to become more familiar with the work outside of just, you know, attending lecture and studying for tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that that definitely helps. It definitely helps kind of, it also, it probably grows your passion for the field as well. Yeah, so. definitely. You kind of, when you're reviewing it and studying it, you see like, oh, like I'm really interested in this part, you know, maybe like personality disorders more as opposed to like the neurodevelopmental aspect of it. And you can kind of like figure out more where you might want to go. Right, right. How about, I kind how about of want to speak to um, this as well. And I think, you know, I think oftentimes there's people that kind of come to the field maybe a little bit later in their path, um, like, like myself. So I think it's, it's also important just for anybody applying to residency in general as kind of some broad advice. I think it would be very beneficial to keep in mind that the most important thing to show on your application is just, you know, the fact that you are a versatile person, that you are like, you know, participating in extracurricular activities. Um, any type of leadership role you can take in or take part in or um, pursue is really helpful. Any kind of community outreach, um, teaching positions like what Katie mentioned. Um, for myself, I was really involved in student government from early on in medical school. And then I was um, eventually like the president of student government for my last semester of basic sciences. And through that, we did a lot of um, fundraising and outreach programs. And it wasn't specifically psych targeted, but I think what that ends up showing is just different qualities that you will bring to your eventual residency, right? Because at the end of the day, these programs, they're looking for someone that's going to, you know, bring forth these qualities that will be useful to them. As much as they want to know that you're going to be a good psychiatrist, they also want to know that you're going to be a good colleague for them to work with, somebody that's going to be a team player, someone that's mm -hmm. going to, you know, bring the program forward and contribute um, while, while you're there. So that's just something to keep in mind because I know that, you know, at this point, many of you are probably already in your third year or fourth year and you're probably thinking, okay, you know, I can't really do any of that yet or anymore. You can't really change what you've done, but there's always opportunities moving forward where you can like add specific things that are a little bit more targeted or that bring forth or highlight those aspects or those, you know, qualities that programs are looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure if my experience with it would would be um, relevant, at least to this question, because I come from a very different world. Um, but I, I will assume that some of the audience is from the Middle East, from, from that part of the world, and from that educational background. Um, this is something I see now, I run into now with um, colleagues, 
or folks from my medical school in Egypt that are reaching out to me to try to get into the system. And they have these beautiful CVs with all the student associations and organizations back in Egypt. And it breaks my heart because I don't have it in me to tell them, like, dude, none of this matters here. Nobody knows the uh, organization of the governor of the city of Mansoura. I mean, nobody knows that here. So I guess the piece of advice I would give to somebody coming from the other side of the Atlantic is the earlier, earlier you try to, uh, the earlier you can locate and somehow associate with any of the international organizations that have branches over there in the Middle East. And there's a lot of that, like USAID stuff, even Prometric, any of that stuff. Just latch onto them in any capacity. That way when somebody here in America, a program here in America, looks at your resume, they can see some words that they recognize that make right. sense to them uh, rather than wasting, yeah. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I mean, I think in a way, like, kind of what's going on now in the world with everything going virtual is also a blessing kind of for foreign medical graduates and international medical graduates yes. because organizations like like PsychSign, like we have our conference now virtually, or like the APA has many different events. Like now the National mm. uh, APA conference is going to be virtual this year. So it gives people a chance to kind of tune in from all over the world. You don't have to fly to the San Francisco's or the Philadelphia's or the Houston's. Like you can actually yeah. just address everything from from your living room, from like join and make those connections. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's definitely important. I think showing interest for like in psychiatry is important. Like you want to show I think as a student and as you progress through school that psychiatry was on your mind at some point. Like it wasn't just something that at the end of fourth year you're just like, oh, I'm going to apply to psychiatry. Like it's like I think you want to show a pattern of some kind of activities. Um, how much did you guys think about like ERAS applications early on in like as like a basic science student? Like were, was it on your mind ever? Like no. <laughs> I think so. Not for me. No. Yeah, yeah. I guess, like, being the kind of person I am, you know, I I, I work well under pressure. <laughs> um, I think I kind of, you know, when it came down to it, I think early on I was definitely thinking about diversifying um, the experiences that I had because I knew that that would be important, but I wasn't spe thinking specifically in terms of my ERAS application. And um, kind of speaking on what Fry was saying, you know, um, having worked with a lot of international medical graduates and foreign medical graduates even um, during my quick shifts in the States, I think one thing that's really important is um, having U.S. clinical experience if you're working or if you're planning on matching into, in the States, which I think is kind of the goal of most of the people that are probably going to be watching this conference. Um, uh -huh. And, you know, like early on thinking about your U.S. application, I can't say that I did that. But definitely as soon as you do realize, oh, wait a second, <laughs> I probably should, yeah. you know, cater some of this stuff specifically. It's helpful. Do you guys think, do you guys think that now the, um, like, psychiatry is becoming more competitive of a specialty to go into? Do you think application or, uh, like, program directors are putting more emphasis on certain things? As, as opposed to others, like I mean, I know, I know you, Dr. Fitzgerald, Dr. Uh, Gill, like you guys have both, like are only a year out of match, or like only a year. Like it seems like I'm sure it seems like a long time ago, but also not not too long ago. So do you guys think that like there's there's different emphasis by programs now on certain things? Like on your application, do you think like grades matter more now, or is it just like USMLE scores or the activities kind that we talked about? What do you guys think about all that? I feel like Dr. Morgan has been in a program for four years. He's probably seen the shift. What, what do you think, Dr. Morgan? Well, I, I think it's kind of like the other way around. Now that it's become more competitive and there's more demand on it, different programs are just going to start inventing metrics to, um, to filter it down. Like to give you an example from our program, our program has seven spots. And we get somewhere between, over the course of the past years, it's been between 1,200 to 1,500 applications. And you're going to narrow those down to about 180 to 100 interviewees. Um, and I remember program director told me like the process. There's they have they there's some software they, that they is designed particularly for this. They plug in step scores, for example, as an initial 
filter. So they don't even look at those um, app applications. They're just, let's say, 500 are taken out of the system. Right. So it really comes down to which program you're talking about. I think it's it should be the other way around, at least from my perspective. Once you identify a couple programs that you feel you're interested in, you put out feelers and you try to figure out what they're looking for, talk with people, interact, look at their websites, what kind of publications, and then based on that, you might want to um, tweak your um, what you, what you're putting on your on your application or in your CV or your resume. All right, All right. Um, that makes sense. Coming from someone who's at a community uh, focused program right now, so my program is very heavy on community psychiatry, and so they are looking for applicants that are more interested in that, as well as um, kind of like your experience locally, so to say. So you know you want to be in a certain area um, as a third or fourth year. Say you want to stay in um, New Jersey or California, wherever you may want to go. It's really important that you do some electives or clinical experience in that state. Um, it will favor you come application season. I know that we specifically are like looking for Georgia friendly applicants. So have you were like done um, electives in Georgia? It doesn't even need to be um, psychiatry per se, but you could have done family medicine, something. How familiar are you with this state? Yeah. Um, and that's pretty important for community programs, at least where I am, I know. Um, for example, my year, I think I'm the only one that's not from Georgia, Florida, or like South Carolina. So. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So they want, obviously they want some kind of ties geographically or some kind of maybe a family member or something, something that you've done yeah. in, uh, in the state. Um, now that, that kind of brings me to my next kind of set of questions about clinicals, clinical rotations and everything. How do you guys, how did you guys stand out in clinicals? How do you approach them? So you're obviously not only looked upon favorably, but also to get those letters of recommendation that we all need, that we all ask everybody for. And what was your guys' experience there? What do you think kind of helped set you apart from just other, I don't know, average medical students or people that just like kind of just coasted through them? Like what kind of things did you guys do? I actually think this is a really interesting question because um, being a resident now, you know, and working with medical students, it's so unique to see it from the other perspective because like as residents, we're grading medical students. So I can tell you what we look for in good medical students because, like, as a medical student, you know, when you're kind of in it, everybody is, like, trying to do their best and you know that you need to, like, make it known if you're interested in the specialty. Um, but, yeah, like, that kind of – a lot of that is the same. But some of the things that I would say are really helpful or beneficial are if you want to do something, like, make it known as soon as possible. Like, hey, I'm really excited to be in this rotation. You know, I actually am really interested in this field. And ask, like, I, I love it when people ask me for any kind of, like, advice or if they're like, what can I do to, like, make sure that, you know, I stand out or, like, is there anything specific that you think would, you know, be helpful in me showing, like, or putting my best foot forward. Um, being willing to do work and, mm -hmm. like, you know, helpful but, like, not annoying, <laughs> which is really mm -hmm. important. We, we <laughs> deal with that, too. Um, mm -hmm. and just being friendly and nice and right. like I said, just kind of going the extra mile, I think is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. okay. And just little okay. things too, you know, like showing up on time, like don't be late, um, right. staying until you, your resident like dismisses you or your attending dismisses you little, not asking like, can I go now? Uh, any of these kinds of things are not going to look good if you want to go into psychiatry and you're asking your senior, you know, can, can I leave now? Like, when am I done? It's going to look like you're not as determined or passionate or dedicated to the field. Right. It's, something, it's funny how we sometimes forget the little things, like being on time, saying maybe please or thank you, just being polite, like being nice to also like staff, like, mm -hmm. like different kind of, like, like, like I think we sometimes focus so much on attendings and residents that we may maybe uh, students treat the nurses poorly or the social workers poorly or their patient patient interaction like people also like like students also need to know that people are always watching in a sense like it's not just like you can't just like say like oh the attending's gone i can just chill so what do you think dr morgan you you have been working with medical students for, for <laughs> years now and how did you guys 
you've covered pretty much everything that needs to be said. I think what I would add is one, number one, be uh, speaking to the students. Number one is be genuine. Don't feel that there's a script that you have to follow because that that's what gets you the brownie points. It, it shows when it's not real. It shows. Um, mm-hmm. So that's that's the first one. Be genuine. If you're interested, like like Ruby said, let it be known that you're interested and be open to what is is going to be um, requested of you. Which leads me to my second point: be, be humble. Um, you, there will be times when you will be given things to do that you don't want to do. And I mean that that comes out to all of us, not just to students. There's, it, it's a pecking order, and there's always going to be somebody on top of you that's at some point is going to tell you to do something you don't want to do. Um, so be humble and acknowledge that you're you're there to learn. Don't try to show off what you know. I know that you don't know a lot. I mean, if, if I'm a fourth year resident and you're a third or fourth year student, you don't try to impress me. That's that's not what your your mission there is not to impress me impress me with your knowledge. I want all that. You're somebody I can rely on. You're somebody that follows, um, like gets gets work done when given instructions. When they don't, when they feel they don't know what to do, they come back and ask questions. So mm-hmm. that's really what I want from from a student. So it's right. those two things: be genuine and be humble. That's which I would say to to myself, honestly. It's this is not just specific for medical students. Yeah, yeah, it kind of trickles down all over through our entire careers, I think, but especially yeah. in our training as psychiatry residents and everything. Um, obviously, clinical uh, clinical experience, U.S. clinical experience is important, um, but a lot of uh, FMGs, whether they're in South America or in Asia or Europe or whatever, have difficulty getting that foot in the door here with clinical experience. Do you guys um, have any experience or know anybody who has done like paid for like observerships or anything, any of those like programs like AmeriClerkships that kind of you pay for a rotation for like a four week psychiatry rotation. Do you guys, can you guys kind of uh, talk about that a little bit? Like if you have any, any knowledge on that? I think I rotated with one girl in Miami who had, um, who was doing that. She was going through AmeriClerkships and I mean, I think it's very challenging. Um, a lot of people, from what I understand, you know, kind of, you know, pay these big bucks and try to do these clerkships. And I I hope it ends up working out for everyone, but a lot of times it doesn't and it can be very pricey. So I would just be like mindful, um, you know, because there's multiple other things that you can also do that will help you out rather than just that. Like don't put all your eggs in one basket is what I'm going to say. Because I have seen it unfortunately not work out for people. Um, Right. And they end up being like, you know, like it's it's really expensive. So just being mindful, knowing that, yes, it is important, but there are other ways to get, you know, U.S. clinical experience. Like um, I know, Dr. Fitzgerald, you worked in as like was it a mental health tech prior to residency. Yeah, I worked as a tech in a child and adolescent unit. And even now, I feel like I talk about it a lot at work because they're techs and I can kind of relate to them and I have more of an appreciation because I understand what it's like to be back there with the patients, right. you know, from 8 to 16 hours, like just you and them. Because we see them right as physicians on the unit. We go out, we do morning rounds, maybe we see them again in the afternoon, but we're not with them one-to-one all day um, right. seeing every little thing. So. For me, that was a great experience as well because it was at a hospital, too, that had residents. So I was able to talk to them and kind of see their medications, keep up with it, lead some groups, um, mindfulness groups, uh, yeah, coping skills, different things. Got to observe them and that. Got to see, like, what worked, what didn't work. Almost, like, practice my own interviewing with them. Not like, yeah. or went into interviewing as a resident to see how well it would be accepted. So, te- like, jobs like this, even medical assistant jobs, as long as you're still involved in the field, um, we want to see you, that you still have like a continued experience, that you haven't been out of school for three years, you know, and you've been doing something else and now you're applying for residency and you're expected to pick up the roles of a physician. As long as you can yeah. have your clinical skills sharp, um, I think that that's what residencies would appreciate. Yeah, I think I think that's that's actually a really good point with just like there's more than one way to show interest in psychiatry. It doesn't need to be the clerkships that you pay thousands of dollars to do for a like, couple weeks. Like you can be like a mental health like 
tech, you can do, like volunteer certain places, you can like homeless shelters, you can do like some kind of like addiction clinics or things like that. Like there's definitely Dr. Morgan different actually ways. did a lot of a lot of research, right? Dr. Morgan, that was I think the thing that Yeah, it was so I was actually I was counting some names in, in my head. Uh, I, I did not do any of those paid internships. Um, I did. Uh, I think once something like that is commodified, it loses its weight. Honestly, um, I'm, I'm a firm believer in the power of personal connections. I'm not you're not going to manipulate people, but my my foot in the door at Wake Forest um, was five persons removed. So I was introduced to a. Um, hospitalist who knew another hospitalist who knew a third who knew an internist who knew a psychiatrist in private practice who introduced me to the chairperson at Wake Forest over the course of about a year um, so the power of connections I, I'm a firm believer in that and if if somebody says I don't know man I don't know what I can help you with but here's what I can do and in your mind you're like how the heck is that going to help me how am I going to go from point a that's being offered to point Y that I want to be at, just take it. You don't know how that's going to unfold. So I started working out as a, um, I was doing some coding and billing in a um, hospitalist practice, and somehow I ended up after a year um, as a research um, associate at Wake Forest, and and that was how I got into, um, that was how I exposed myself to the department, so to speak. Uh, I just walked, I, I literally walked around the building knocking on doors and saying, hey, my name is Prime Morgan, here's my job title, but I'm actually here to show you that next match season, I'm somebody you should rank. What should I do today to start showing you guys that? And I, I guess it worked. And if somebody regrets it, they haven't told me yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They don't regret That's it. That's right. Everybody loves you. <laughs> Thank you. That's actually, that's actually a really good segues. I swear it's like you guys like have my agenda in front of you guys. Because um, I wanted to talk about kind of connections. Like I think all, often like students go through a rotation and then they either forget about that attending or the connection just disappears. I think it's important for students also to kind of keep in touch with these attendings, especially like your psychiatry attendings. Maybe reach out to them. So if you did like a, a third year clerkship like by by the end of fourth year, they still remember you, or they still kind of know your name. So then, when applications come around, you can kind of either ask them for a letter, or maybe they have some say in programs. Kind of just like what you were saying, Dr. Morgan, with kind of just knowing like the chair and being introduced and kind of knocking on doors, so they kind of remember the face. So, so yeah, I, th I definitely think that's 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 an important thing. Um, Even now, beyond that. Yeah, Even beyond attendings, um, Tom, I feel like at the APA conference we went and I would just talk to people presenting, presenting posters and switching numbers and then come, you know, application season touching base and being like, hey, this is my, you know, this is my number. I'd appreciate it if you'd let your PD know I'm applying. I'm really interested. Oh. Keeping in touch. And I think doing that, I got like three interviews alone just from going to the poster sessions and talking to the different residents and saying, hey, yeah. I'm really interested, this is cool, this is my name, and I'm applying this year. Because they do yeah. get many applications, like um, Dr. Morgan was saying, like 1,200. And if, you're, if you happen to know someone that they know, it could be really helpful. Yeah, I could definitely give you that kind of leg up, right? Make it yeah. So you guys definitely think it's valuable going to these conferences or, or doing anything oh, yeah. like virtual or, or open houses or anything like that? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's valuable. Anyway. I was going to say also another um, thing was like, you know, in addition to just keeping in touch with like people in psych, I just think anybody kind of like, I think, uh, yeah, like Dr. Morgan was saying too, like anybody that you know, and Katie was also saying this, like, not just like for me, like one of my surgery attendings, like him and I were like super, super close. And you know, I would text him all the time and just kind of having somebody that's kind of in your corner giving you advice and, you know, when it comes down to writing your personal statement and you want someone to read over it or like someone that's like, hey, like this is something that's worked for somebody else. Like you just, you never know um, what, what expertise somebody may be able to loan. And I think that also like build, building that connection and maintaining those connections is also something that is very important within the field. So that's something that's going to benefit you moving forward. Um, in your career as well. So very important to be maintaining those relationships. 
definitely, definitely. So now let's kind of jump into ERAS applications. Obviously, we all went through the stressful process of putting the, together the applications and begging people for letters and, and all that. So the first thing I wanted to ask you guys is how did you start the process of researching programs? Can you guys talk about like what resources you use, kind of what filters you use? Obviously, as IMGs, we're not, I guess, like able to apply everywhere. Or you, you can, but you can't. You can't expect that a lot of places are going to consider your application just being an IMG alone. So can you guys kind of talk about what resources you use and what, kind of what, what your, your thought process was there? I'll wait till last because I've been so removed from the process, so keep me for last on that one. <laughs> okay. Um, first, I would say know your limitations, like what your school will, like where you can and can't match. So some, like for example, when I was applying, there were certain states that were labeled like red states um, that we didn't have licensure or we weren't approved to match there yet. So don't just, you know, put all of these applications out there to states that you can't match at and just waste all your money applying there. Um, when you can't even go there to begin with. So know where you can and can apply. And then once you have that down, um, you'll have like a certain set like of states where you can go. And then I would go to different larger IMG schools. They have a list that they put out, right, where all their um, students have matched. So then you know that those um, residencies are IMG friendly and they list it on the website. So you can go and say like, you know, XYZ school match list 2020 and they'll say, where so and so like psychiatry at Wake Forest, psychiatry at Gateway, and then you know that programs are at least IMG friendly. Right. Um, to me, that's something that I made sure to do when compiling my list. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, I th I think do you use any? Oh, let me do, just one, one second, Dr. Gill. Um, let me just ask Dr. Fitzgerald. Did you use any programs like Frida, or like did you use like Match a Resident, or any any of those like? I think I used Match a Resident, but it wasn't exactly, like, the most helpful thing. You know, like, I don't think I needed to. I don't think I got anything more from it than if I hadn't used it. I remember getting a lot of, um, like, interview invites from places that Match a Resident was, like, lower on the list and then not getting them to places where it was, like, you have a, like, 100% chance. So it didn't really, like, it doesn't correlate as much okay. as we expected to. Got it. Got it. Okay. Dr. Gill, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's okay. Um, I guess the advice that I was going to give is kind of uh, going against the grain of what most people say. Um, and the only reason I give this advice is because it worked out for me. And I want to say, like, of course, like, follow what Katie, I'm sorry, Dr. Fitzgerald is saying <laughs> in terms of knowing your limitations, in terms of, like, where you definitely cannot apply and, like, where you are, like, guaranteed to, like, not be able to get a spot. But beyond that, like, don't be scared to apply to a program where you're like, I don't know, they haven't had an IMG. Like, send an email, reach out to them before application season even begins and be like, hey, I'm really interested in your program, you know, like, I would love to come there. Like, see if you can get an away rotation there. See, like, what kind of a response they give you and apply. Like, if there's somewhere you're passionate about that you want to go, but, like, no, like they have, like, I'm, like, two IMGs in the whole program, and you're like, oh, like, the odds are not going to be in my favor, I still encourage you to continue to you know try to do that because you never know unless you try right and that being said like being IMG one of the downside is that we are going to have to cast a much broader net so make sure you save up for residency maps like I don't know how interviews are going to be moving forward but um the odds are definitely stacked against you so the more programs you apply to the more opportunity that you will have likely you are to get more interviews and you know I would really say like just keep that in mind and be mindful like whenever you're um you know even scheduling your interviews or when you're applying to programs like I know for me I had one week where I had five interviews and I was literally like flying back and forth but I was able to do it in a way that I ended up saving money because like a few of them were like within the same area and you know you just you have to be very smart about it um but before you even get interviews yeah like don't be scared of applying somewhere that you think like is too big of a fish, you know, go for it, like apply, send them an email, let them know. You never know what people are looking for. And maybe you're like that one person that they're like, wow, like this person really seems genuinely interested. And maybe you have something that they want. You never know. Um, and also just, I was going to say when you're looking in terms of um, like, 
interviews to, or not interviews, sorry, programs to apply to. Like now, this year, because they did online interviews, it was very difficult. Like the IMG Mastery, I was just reading a statistic. I think it went down by like 6%. But it's because I think that IMGs maybe were applying to the same number of programs that they had previously, but other people were applying to more programs than they typically would. Like U.S. graduates, I think, applied to way more programs, and they attended way more interviews than they typically would. So just be mindful of these types of things that are going to be also very important in determining where you end up going and what interviews you're going to end up having. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I did not use any of the softwares you mentioned, Tom. Um, I I think the one thing I would add is just know where you have connections. Um, Mm -hmm. That really is going to be the game changer for you. Um, And again, I'm speaking to a very very specific population, like the Middle East, that's been my experience. Um, For whatever reason, I have a recollection that like someplace like California, for example, I couldn't even apply there. It's been five years. I honestly don't remember why. But there was something about being an IMG from uh, from Egypt. Uh, also, some places have very have different cutoffs for step scores for IMG versus U.S. grads, so you might want to pay attention to that. Um, yeah. But other than that, um, my uh, yeah, two gracious colleagues here have covered it all. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I agree with what you guys were saying. Definitely about knowing the states. That's the first thing. Like, you don't want to just waste your money applying to states that you can't even qualify for, like California. California, a lot of Caribbean medical schools, and I'm sure a lot of uh, schools overseas, they're, like, blacklisted or, or some kind of, like, gray list where it's, like, they're you're not, like, typically denied, but you're not approved either. Knowing that also... I just want our audience to know about like visas, like J1, H1B visas. If you need a visa, yeah. making sure you do the research, making sure programs are able to sponsor those. Because if a program sees that you're an IMG or an FMG and they can't even do visas, automatically your your money is basically down the down the trash because they, they won't even look at your application. Um, Dr. Morgan, you mentioned kind of step scores a little bit and everything. Do you feel like the cutoffs are getting more competitive. I know I've been getting a lot of emails from students kind of internationally saying like, hey, like, what's the cutoff for psychiatry? Or is it getting, like, is that kind of what they're, what they're zone, like honing in on when they say psychiatry is getting more competitive? So that's, I'm, I'm glad you bring up that question because I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of urban legend around that, um, around the step scores. So are the cutoffs going up? Yes. Let's, let's start out with that. Why? Nothing special about step scores. Your step scores do not correlate to your clinical performance. Um, even program directors that will tell you that. They'll tell you, like, your step scores don't really tell them. I can go ahead and tell you, my, my step scores, honestly, I, look like a, a, a rubbish bin, if you, if you look just on paper. Um, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's, it's tragic. Um, But why do they use step scores? Because at this point, this is the only objective standard to to filter people out. Mm -hmm. So I want to give that as reassurance to begin with. But really, yeah, you're going to have to, as an IMG, um, particularly. um, So IMGs are are not all created. Well, we're created equal, but they they don't end up being equal. Like (laughs) folks from um, you guys, for example, you're even higher than overseas IMGs. Middle East, India, and all that, because at least you guys get at some point uh, some exposure to rotations um, in America. Um, so for people from my background, if you're intent on doing step and matching in America, this is something you should have in mind from year one or two of medical school. And there is no score too high. You cannot put too much work into getting high step scores. Um, and I, I want to piggyback up off something Dr. Gill said about even if on paper a place is known that it's not really one of your choices or the statistics are stacked against you, I would I would acknowledge that, but I would also dive in knowing that I'm taking a risk. And again, I, I speak out of personal experience. My statistics, like looking up the numbers and the stats and the data and all that when I was applying to residency, I was also applying to PA school at the same time. I was like, there's probably no likelihood that I'm getting into residency, maybe PA school. Here he is, um, guys. <laughs> so I, I really want to emphasize this a lot to IMGs. Even if it looks horrible on paper, jumping in, there's so many variables that 
simply cannot be quantified on paper and on websites. Mm -hmm. So might as well take the dive. Right. I don't know how I ended up talking about this from the question you gave me, but here I am. <laughs> it was an important fact to say. Um, I also just wanted to say, you know, being mindful of the fact that step one is now going to be pass fail. I know that people have mixed feelings about that, but that being known, that means that your step one score, if you've already written step one, is very likely not going to be used as the determinant to weigh how you do, but your step two will have more emphasis on it. Now, I know typically people do better on step two than they do on step one, so I would really encourage you, and like, we're lucky that we have our shelf exams, right? Like when you're going through um, your clerkship, you have shelf exams, that really helps you prepare for step two. So kind of focusing on that step two and then getting step three done. Like if you're an IMG and you didn't match, finishing step three, having that out of the way is huge. It will help you yep. so much because that's just one less thing that your program, potential program needs to worry about. So definitely get that out of the way and that will definitely work in your favor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Do you guys feel that with psychiatry, though, like we mentioned step scores, we mentioned cutoffs, do you feel like psychiatry PDs um, take a more holistic approach, though, to your application as opposed to maybe an IM uh, program director or surgery or pediatrics? Do you feel like, like, I know we've mentioned, like, activities, psychiatry activities and showing that you're well-rounded, but do you think, like, that they that's actually their approach, that they look at everything and they don't necessarily see oh, you barely passed step one, like, we're going to throw you out. Like, do you think they consider just multiple factors? I think that it's important to know that, yes, like, most definitely, I think psychiatry attendings and, I'm sorry, program directors look at people more holistically. But at the same time, if you have multiple attempts and you have failed step one, like, multiple times, like, that is still not going to, you know, that's still going to be a red flag. So, like, work on that exam, and if you're already at the point where you've done that, try to do something to, like, you know, account for it or, like, um, compensate in some way or, like, you know, show growth. Um, but kind of going back to the original point, I think, like, I know in our program, like, our program director is a wonderful person, and he really looks for a very specific type of person. He wants someone that's going to fit into our program, very, like, family-oriented, somebody who's, like, charismatic, caring, um, it, it, it really speaks to a program director's ability to pick the kind of people they're looking for when you look at, like, the culture within a residency program, and I think um, Dr. Morgan could probably attest to this, like, within our program, like, it's kind of amazing how well everyone gets along, <laughs> because everyone really is very similar in... Um, not just in personality, but also in, like, the way that you approach things. Um, you know, programs that are going to be looking for how you deal with conflict. I know I got a lot of interview questions about, you know, conflict resolution or, like, a difficult situation I've been in. Um, they, they don't really, like, once you're at the point where you have an interview, it's like they don't care anymore about your scores, right? At this point, they're really trying to look at who you are. And as much of that as you can put forward in your application or in your personal statement, that definitely will benefit you if you're showing a person that has some of those attributes or qualities that, you know, at the end of the day, anybody in psychiatry would want for you to have. Because, you know, this field is about connecting with human beings, right? right? We're not trying to, I don't know, like, I mean, of course, there's like academic integrity, right? Like we need to with like uphold a standard and know our medicine but the the work that we do day to day is more so based on who you are as a person so that's the most important thing right. i think right. dr fitzgerald what do you think about kind of like the holistic approach to like psychiatry applicants and medical students what's your yeah so my actually my program director was talking to me about this because um i'm an img and she's like there are so I feel like there are so many IMGs that get overlooked. Um, and she was saying that it's she because personally for me I didn't match the first time I post matched into the program and she said I don't understand how you didn't match. Like you have everything that a program would want. How do we get applicants like you? Like how do we look for ones like you? Why are they not getting accepted? Like why are these IMGs not getting accepted? And we we talked about it and she said. It, come, it came down to um, the known experience that American grads get from third and fourth year clerkships. Like they know they're all getting a standardized um, third and fourth year like quality 
education and their concern is just they don't know where we're doing our clinicals in the U.S. So maybe highlighting that point to them, you know, that you have done this, you've got this experience, um, so that they can feel a bit more assured that you're getting a good learning experience in the U.S. Um, right. And I think also, also like describing it on your ERAS application. I think oftentimes we think like, oh, our medical transcripts are just going to be sent. They'll know where we did like our clerkships. But instead, like they, I mean, they teach us IMGs to, to really describe those rotations. Say like mm -hmm. what you did and where you did and how long you did it for. Just so like yeah. your programs are aware of it. Absolutely. That was that actually, yeah. Sorry, Katie. Go ahead, you, Dr. Gill. No, I, I was just going to say um, that was actually something that I did on my application. Like underneath every single rotation I had, I wrote down like in detail what I did in each rotation, the level of patient exposure I had, the level of responsibility I had, like how many patients I carried, if I worked with residents, if I didn't work with residents. Um, and that was something that during my interviews, actually a lot of programs commented on. Um, they were like, wow, like, you know, it was really helpful to see this that, you know, you had this experience, like, we didn't know that Caribbean schools, like, I actually ended up interviewing at a few programs where it weren't very, like, quote-unquote, ING friendly, and, yeah, they, like, made comments about that, so that was, that was something that was um, definitely helpful, and I, I, I mean, I don't think we mentioned it when we talked about ERS applications, but that's something that I, I would highly encourage everyone to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's definitely, that's definitely right. How, how important is research on your application? Students ask me all the time, like, I don't have research or I don't have psychiatry, um, special, special psychiatry research, like, I have different kind of research. Or, like, what do you guys think about just having research as a medical student? Is it overrated? Is it kind of just, like, not looked upon? Like, is it, like, what do you guys think about that? I think it depends on which program you're applying to. If you're going to like a big academic institution that is very heavy on research, then you're going to want to need research, right? right. Um, I personally had, I think, zero psych research on my application. Mm -hmm. But I think it really varies. All right. Dr. Morgan, what do you think? I research either for what it's worth. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Morgan, what do you think about research on your application? Did, 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 I think we lost them. Did we lose them? <laughs> I'm here. I'm here again. Okay. Yeah, I had a text snap. Nora, um, so what do, you, what do you think about what do you think about research? Like having research as a medical student, do you think it's it's necessary? Like when you're applying for residency programs, especially psychiatry. I see. I don't have a yes or no answer to that. Looking at it from now, like I can't say anything is is unnecessary. It adds value. For sure, um, this is, this is one of those situations where maybe a single item in and of itself doesn't have enough value, but if you eliminate enough single items, you end up in trouble. So, I, if you have an opportunity to for research, and even if it's not related to psychiatry, slap it on that application. It shows at least that you're somebody who knows how to do research. I mean, it, it's I, I did some of my um, I was lucky that almost all my research was in was in psychiatry, and then I had a segue through neurobiology. Um, but I don't see how if it was in a separate, in a different specialty, I couldn't have spun that as, "Hey, I know how to crunch numbers and do literature and run a study." Um, <laughs> if if you have an opportunity come up to do anything that will get you exposure or contact with an academic setting in America, go for it, even if you don't see a direct connection between what it is and where you want to be. Right. Okay. I think that's a really important point that Dr. Uh, Morgan brought up about how, you know, at the end of the day, you want a well-rounded application, right? Like, lose enough things, you're going to end up with nothing. So, yeah, um, that's, you know, that's a really good way of looking at it, that you really want to yeah. kind of try to do as much as you can in yeah. as many areas as you can. Yeah. But it's not going to it's not going to be like an end-all, be-all if you don't have research. All right. All right, definitely. And I think it's, yeah, like you were saying, it's kind of program specific. Some programs look at it more favorably. Some programs don't really care about it too much. Um, we, I had a question from one of the students, and we kind of indirectly talked about this, but I kind of wanted to throw it out there for you guys. Uh, the student has been years after graduating from medical school, 
and they're kind of talking, they want to know how they can be more attractive as an applicant. Obviously, we talked about getting more psych experience in terms of the activities, not necessarily clerkships, but some kind of activities. Do you guys have any other um, kind of advice for these students who are not fresh out of medical school and applying that direct year, or maybe they haven't matched in a couple of years, um, to kind of make themselves a little bit more attractive as an applicant? I mean, I personally My can't initial... speak to that. Oh. No, sorry, go, go ahead. No, I had nothing really to say. I was just going <laughs> to <laughs> Um my, my initial reaction to that one, because, I have, again, a lot of my classmates from back in Egypt have been reaching out to me the past couple of years. Just to put in perspective, my class, we graduated seven or eight years ago, 20, like late 2013, 2014. So, and I still have some folks that are exploring this process now. My first thing is, instead of just wallowing in a morass of programs, um, try to identify one or two programs and latch onto those any way possible. If you know somebody that knows another person that lives down the street from a program that you want to be in, latch onto that and just get personal, get personal identification because you want to be able when applications are being reviewed because again part of the elimination criteria is folks that are X years out of graduation for example that's one of those automated elimination criteria you want to be able to say hey remember me we talked like two months ago can you specifically pull out my application and I will go ahead and say like I've done that with my program director for folks I know I went straight to their office and said hey this person here's the name here's their number make sure you if possible pull up that application Otherwise, they would have been eliminated. So you want that personal contact. Yeah, it's all about the connections, kind of turning over every leaf. Um, what do you think? What do you guys think, uh, Dr. Gill, Dr. Fitzgerald? Um, I know that when I didn't match, I was I reached out to a student, or he was a res he's a resident now, but he went to UMHS with us, and he was at yeah, his program. They have a research program, and you go there and you do a year of research, and it's a really like solid way to get your foot in the door with residency, meet the residents, like show them you're committed, show them you're dedicated, your hard work, like working, you're competent. Um, right. Building off of what Dr. Morgan said, like kind of narrow it down as opposed to like just shooting everywhere, find two or three that are solid programs where you can really get your foot in and kind of go 100% with them. Okay. That makes sense. That I would sense. just say, and I mean, I you know, I haven't been to this experience myself, but if I were to be looking at applications, I think I would be more likely to want to interview someone who did something like what Katie did, like where she was working in mental health, you know, mm -hmm. and she kind of mentioned this before, like you, even though you're not in residency, like make sure that whatever you're doing, you're not just like sitting around, I don't know, pursuing something like I mean, and if, by all means, if you have to, like, work at a bank to make ends meet or do something else, like, that's totally cool. Like, we get it. You know, life goes on. But make sure that there's some kind of a consistent thread that shows that you have been consistently working towards this. Um, I actually met in my – one of my last psych electives. I did a sub -I in Miami. It was this guy. He actually went to a U.S. school. And he, after graduating, took a few years off and went to Hollywood and wanted to be, like, a music producer. And he didn't match. And um, the lo and he was, like, genius, like, very, very smart, like, great grades, like, all about psych, all through med school, everything. But he didn't match. And the reason he didn't match was they were like, well, when you came back and applied, you'd been in California doing music, like, and now you're telling us if you want to do psych. Like, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So just make sure that you know, you explain if you are doing something like, let's say you don't match and then you end up working in a bank for three years, explain to them that like, hey, like this was the reason I did that. And, you know, um, have something there that shows that you still had that passion or that, you know, goal in mind that you were still working towards it in some way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that you haven't right. lost your clinical experience. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. You remember where the heart and the chest are, the lungs, you know, you know yeah. where that is, just in case. Even though you don't really touch patients in psychiatry, but you still at least know some basic like, anatomy. My ear is hurting. <laughs> 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 All 
Um, now that we kind of talked about ERAS applications, can we talk about um, just the match season interviews? Can you talk about how you guys prep for interviews? Do you recommend anything like mock interviews or just like how did you guys go about making sure that you put that best foot forward on, on interview day? I just I have to say something because this is something that came to my attention recently in helping a friend prepare for interviews is it is like we're I mean a lot of us are very fortunate in that you know we're generally people people and we're able to communicate well but when we get nervous everybody turns into like a puddle okay and you need somebody that's going to be objective with you and tell you truthfully like if let's say you've applied to match and you have like a pretty good application and you know you feel like you're going to match and then you don't match and you don't know why and then you look at your application and you look at like let's say your friend's application or someone else and you have equivalent if not better scores or whatever else and you just don't know why you're not matching the problem likely is that you are not good at interviewing and it's so important to be aware of that and have someone help you through it i cannot say like how big of a deal that is like having participated in resident interviews this year and i'm sure like um you know my other two panelists can speak to this like if someone's awkward or weird or if they just give off like a weird vibe like we like blacklist them you know like because you want to work with people that you're going to get along with you want to work with people that you think are going to be like you know easy to work with that are going to be like quote unquote normal right so and I know that, like, for me, I get really nervous, and then I don't stop talking, and, like, I might come across <laughs> a certain way. So you want someone that's going to be helpful and honest with you to help you, like, practice and overcome that. I think that's, like, a huge piece right. of advice. All right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Do you guys have anything else to add? Anything that you guys can kind of... I should be... It's so hard because it's Zoom this time, right? But when I went... I was just um, how you interact with the other residents applying to. And they can be great connections for you. When I didn't match, you know, if that is the unfortunate case that happens for you, I would recommend just swallowing your pride and letting your connections know as soon as possible. Because I told this girl that I had interviewed with, I was like, oh, my God, I didn't match. I can't believe it. And a month later, she said, Katie, a spot opened up at my program. I told my and I met her on an interview. You know, she wasn't someone I had gone to medical school with. She wasn't, like, a very close friend of mine. She was just someone I had met. We'd gone to two interviews together by chance, and we just right. kept in touch. And she is the one that kind of helped me get an, another post-match interview where I am now. So That's kind of being mindful of that. You're, you're, you're all looking to get a residency spot, but it doesn't have to be, like, a cutthroat process. All right. And I think this year, this year especially with like the Zoom interviews, and we don't know how it's going to be next year with the applicants, but like with Zoom interviews, it's tough to sometimes show your personality. Obviously, body language, they can only see you from chest up. But, like they don't see kind of how you're walking around, how like just the overall body language. I think it's especially important to really embrace the moment and show that personality and show that you're smiling, polite, you're asking questions. Um, Dr. Morgan, obviously, like you've seen a lot of residents come through the program and everything, and kind of what have you, what, what has been your experience like with with just like residents interviewing? Like, what do you think they do wrong? What do you think they do right? Like, what makes people stand out? So I'm I'm going to deviate a little bit from what my uh, gracious colleagues said about, <laughs> and this might be just my personal style and my preference when I'm interacting with applicants. Mm -hmm. There's no script to follow in an interview. The whole point of an interview is to see who you are. If you follow a script, one, it's going to come off as a script. Two, we didn't get to see who you were, so even if I rank you high based on who I think you are, you're not going to maintain that facade. Um, my style when I'm interviewing for a, for a job for me or when I when I'm with applicants, I want to identify the factual objective talking points that I want to make sure I get across. I have those crystal clear in my mind, mm -hmm. and then I'm just freestyling from there because I, I, I just want to show who I am as I organically say, though, and like, as possible. Fry, Fry is also, he's one of those people that are naturally very charming. <laughs> 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 right? Yeah. Like it, look, thank you, Ramiz. But really, really, I mean, you know how how stilted it comes off when people yeah. come come in with a script, or they feel that um, they have it's to say. There, there really is. 
Yeah, yeah and it, it, that's that's the awkwardness Ramit was talking about that we pick up on. It's even it's even worse when you're going to be on Zoom. Just be yourself, man. Just yeah, yeah let it all out. What, what kind of advice do you give to students who have red flags? How do you embrace those red flags? How do you discuss them? Like if somebody brings up a a failed step or like some kind of failed class, like what do you guys recommend for I, for future I applicants think, uh, to kind of? Personally, I think that um, the most important and valuable thing that you can do is just be honest. And kind of mm-hmm. going back on what Fry says, like we can tell when people are genuine. And you would be surprised just how easy it is to pick up on like little cues. Like don't get defensive, you know, don't get um, like frazzled. Like be prepared to answer those questions, not in a scripted way, as like Dr. Morgan was just saying, but just be like, you know what? Yeah, like. This was a really difficult thing for me, and I unfortunately, you know, did fail one of my exams or my classes. And then talk about how you overcame that, you know? Talk about how it helped you grow or, like, how you learned from it. Um, And I think that humility is a hugely important thing. The same way that Dr. Morgan was talking about that when we were discussing, you know, how to do well in your clerkships. Um, Interviewing really is the same thing, essentially. It's like you're trying to put your best foot forward in a very short time frame, you're trying to show who you are and the kind of people that you want to work with. Just imagine if you were to like have to pick a team, right, to do some kind of activity, who would you be most drawn to? Somebody that's like trying super hard and like really nervous about it and like, you know, being like defensive or whatever else. Or would you want someone that's like more relaxed and just like, you know, still professional, still, you know, kind, polite, and, like, able to talk about things that are a little bit uncomfortable. I think it's just important to keep that in mind that at the end of the day, these are also just people trying to see, like, you know, who you are. At this point, you got the interview, (laughs) you know? Now it's all about just showing them who you are and just, just doing your best to put your best foot forward. And, yeah, like, recognizing your shortcomings in a, in a humble and gracious way. Right. I agree with you. Thank you for that. Um, what about, like, coming to the interviews prepared with, like, good questions and stuff like that, like, showing kind of interest in that? Can you guys talk about, like, just, like, the importance of having those questions, the importance of showing um, to that specific program that you're interested in them, not just the general question that they can find on their website or, like, you can find on their website? <clears throat> so what I did with some of mine, actually, I pick out, like, my top 10 programs, and I tailor my URAS personal statement to them. So at the end of my personal statement, I put maybe one paragraph, like three to five sentences about why I want to be at this program, what I like about this program in particular. And when I was doing interviews with the program director, she was like, you know, I saw in your personal statement you mentioned us directly. And it kind of it helps you stand out because everyone's going to have, like, a generic personal statement, right? But if you write one like, hey, I want to be at Rutgers, you know, or I want to be at Oregon, whatever, you know, like, they, it, it sticks out for them. Right, right. I agree with you. Um, what about uh, after interview communication, like sending a thank you letter or, like, a card or an email? Like, what do, what's your guys' thoughts on kind of post-interview I just, communication. I want to go back to your last question really quickly, Tom, because I do think okay. that it is important that people ask questions during interviews. Um, mm-hmm. One trick <laughs> that I used during my interviews was um, oftentimes in interviews, uh, there will be some type of like a PowerPoint presentation or something that they give in the beginning. And I think that if you haven't already researched the program or if, like, you know, there isn't already some stuff that you know, like, go on the program's website and, like, you'll probably get, like, a list of the people that are going to interview the night before. Like, read, like, the program director's little bio. Like, see what they're doing, right? And um, I think it's important to ask a variety of questions. I think it's important to ask questions, like, sure, ask questions about the program, right? Like, oh, like, I really saw this in your on your website, and I'm, I'm really interested in this, to show that you are genuinely interested in that program. But I also think it's helpful to ask personal questions, you know, mm-hmm. like, because I think that makes that, like, gets rid of some of that barrier, and it kind of decreases, like, the, the formality of things. Like, let's say, for example, you notice that somebody that's interviewing you is, um, I don't know, like, they have, like, a picture of a dog behind them or something, but something. be like, oh, like, I see that, you know, there's 
a picture of like a dog or whatever. Like any opportunity that you have to turn a formal interview into a casual conversation between friends, take it. And like, cause right. like that's like for me, I think that's what worked out the most for me. Like I remember one of my attendings that I work with now, um, I had interviewed with her on my interview day and we get along great. And she, and it's so funny because when I walked into her office, I don't even remember what I did, but I made some comment about something. And before you knew it, we were just talking about like random stuff and like right. the interview was over. Right. And like what that does is that person feels comfortable around you and they feel like they know you it builds a sense of familiarity and like that's the most important thing like they can ask you a scripted set of questions that they're asking everybody else but that is not going to leave as lasting of an impression as like you know a, a, a conversation like that so definitely ask questions that would you know open up the opportunity for a conversation um going on what tom said now uh post interview communications um a thank you note never hurt anybody right like writing a hand a hand written thank you note is like super gracious and super like awesome um send out handwritten thank you notes if you want but honestly even email is good right i think my program that i ranked number one which is where i ended up matching i didn't even do handwritten thank you notes i think i did handwritten thank you notes for like the very first program i ever interviewed at and then after that i was like this is taking a lot of effort <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. I you were just texting by then <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. like, yeah, you know. <laughs> but yeah. I definitely, I, I think thank like you notes like and, a well thought yeah, out email. Ahead. No, no, no yeah. I, that's all I was gonna say. Yeah. I was gonna say like they uh, to keep it real. They they don't change anything. They confirm whatever impression is already in place. Yeah. Um, I, I'll be honest. Uh, I got a couple thank you emails after interviews. If it was somebody I liked, I responded. If it was somebody I didn't get the vibe from, I didn't even respond. Because like yeah. my mind was already. So just to keep it real, yeah. Our audience knows if they ever email you in the future, if you they'll know if you like them based on a reply. So that's <laughs> no, because there's people that I also like that we didn't respond to, right? I think cause okay. the residents are very, very busy, and so are attending. So keep that in mind. If you don't get a response back, it doesn't mean they hate you. But, like, mind you, if you do get a response back, that's a huge deal, because then it's like, whoa, they must really like right. you, you know? Right, right. And then also, also going off of what you said, Dr. Gill, about like kind of just making the interview less formal, um, like talking about a dog or like a hobby or something like that. You can also, if you want to write a thank you card, you can also mention that because it sparks a memory in somebody's mind. It says, hey, that was the guy that harassed me about my dog or <laughs> kept, kept, kept talking about the dog when I wanted yes, to talk about Yes, because that's what you want to do. You want to harass that's, people about their dog. That's, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so now that we kind of talked about interviews, um, I w some people have asked me about um, not matching and like soap and doing going through soap and scramble and then like post match stuff. I know Dr. Fitzgerald, you kind of mentioned about post match matching at your program and connections and everything. Can you talk about the process that you went through, kind of what you would recommend that people do if they don't match, and then kind of like sure. like just your experience overall, yeah. yeah. Okay, so first, I really thought I was going to match. I had like 10 interviews, so at least read the SOAP directions. Like the week before, you never know what's going to happen. Like be prepared just in case. Um, if it does happen, it's not the end of the world. You know, give yourself some time to process it. I think you have like an hour or two before the time opens up for the SOAP. So give yourself like okay. however much time you need to like feel everything, go through it, let yourself, you know, just work it out, and then, like, it's go time. You know, like, you need to have your statement, your personal statements ready. Like, look up the programs that are, um, when the list comes out of who's unmatched, what's open, and just, like, do it ASAP. I know every year I think it, like, this, the website shuts down or something with, like, connectivity problems because so many people are on it, right, trying to find a spot. Right. Um, but think about what you want also. So when I was – when that happened, I reached out to several different people, and they all told me, you know, just apply family. That's got to have the most spots. Like, do this. Um, but I personally know I would be really unhappy in family medicine. So I just right. put all my – so I think you get, like, 25 that you can apply to. Um, I did whatever site was open that was left, and there was, like, maybe 10 that I could apply to, and then the rest of transitional years. Um, yeah. And then you 
get like the hard decision of if you get an offer or not. So I had a transitional year offer um, in North Carolina, but the you only, and you only have like a certain amount of time to reply to it, right? And then it goes to someone else. Um, decide how like how much you want to go into psychiatry and what's there. Because the program that I got the offer at didn't have a psych department, they didn't have a residency, so I would have just been doing pretty much just like general medical duties for I am stuff or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I knew I wouldn't have that great of connections to go in for the next year, right? Because it's kind of an isolated oh, we have some psych patients that come in the E D but there are there's no like residency, there's no department, like there's psychiatrists that are consulted, but there's no real residency follow up after that. Um, so for me, I was like, you know what, it's fine. Um, I'm going to wait and see who who did who decided they didn't want to announce that they didn't, which is going to be a lot less than you think there is. I think my year, there was only two spots that didn't, um, that released after the soap, and it was John Hopkins and Northwest. Yeah, the one in Chicago, Northwestern. And they both said we're not people this year. So I was just like, oh, my God. I felt kind of devastated. Um, I went on and I looked up transitional years that had psych residencies attached to it to try and, you know, apply to them. I let everyone I know um, know that I didn't match. So should something happen at their program, say someone can't fill their spot, like is exactly what happened with mine, um, they thought of me because I I told them, hey, I didn't match. Um, So while it is... It hurts and it's unexpected and it can be like a jab to your ego. Kind of like humble yourself, you know, like try to let it go. Let everyone know that you know that you didn't match so that hopefully um, if something comes up, you're going to be in mind. Right. Awesome. Yeah, so it's basically just about being prepared and then also if it happens to you, just not wallowing in it and just being actually able to hit it head on and just really go and turn everything and do everything you can. Exactly. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, that detailed yeah. answer. Um, now we're kind of just wrapping up, guys. The last last two questions I had from some students were specifically about residency. Obviously, you guys are either starting off or at the end point right now. Um, one question was talking about physician burnout or stigma of mental illness within psychiatry. So first, if you could talk about how you guys deal with physician burnout and then also um, the stigma against psychiatry and how you guys experience that on a day-to-day basis. So if anybody wants to talk about, like, kind of um, physician burnout. Yep. I was going <laughs> to talk about the stigma because all I was going to oh, say is okay. I feel like we've been quite fortunate in that I have not felt any of that. I feel like there's definitely a perception that I was afraid of prior to, mm-hmm. you know, matching when I settled on psychiatry I was like you know what like this is what I really want to do but it was definitely something that crossed my mind and I was concerned about it um you know there's that idea that psychiatrists you know were somehow inferior in the ranks but once you start doing it and you know you're surrounded by colleagues who are equally passionate about the field like you forget about that and you feel like you know we save lives and we're practicing medicine every day and I'm taking care of my patients medical needs like I probably get at least two, three CT scans a week. <laughs> so, you know, we're doing all sorts of medical stuff too. So I, I, I definitely, at least from my perspective, um, that is no longer even something that's on my mind. Mm-hmm. Dr. Morgan, can you talk about kind of the stigma of psychiatry in Egypt and the Middle East and kind of what have your experiences mm-hmm. been like over there or like talking to your friends back home kind of about, about psychiatry in general? Yes, so there's there's a lot of misinformation and also a lot of ignorance about the field of mental health in general um, back in the Middle East. We're, we're still talking like exorcisms back there, so it's yeah. it's a very different level of conversation. Um, that's that was one of the reasons why I didn't want to stay there. Um, it's not at the point where I want to stay and change the narrative about psychiatry. Oh no, we're not there yet. Um, it's and a lot of it is unknown. Like I, I even struggle when I'm talking with friends or colleagues back in Egypt because a lot of the even clinical terminology hasn't even been translated into the Arabic back there. So it's right. it's at that level. Um, I, I want to piggyback on what Ramit said about the stigma, and this might, um, I don't know, maybe Ramit knows I, I have a little bit of a tough love kind of style when it comes to 
learning and teaching, you will be as stigmatized or as valuable as a psychiatrist as you make yourself to be. If you just roll in and you're satisfied with mediocrity and just getting the bare minimum done and knowing just the crude essentials, you will be stigmatized, you will not be taken seriously, and that's, I'm sorry, homie, that's not on you. But if you're diligent about knowing as much as possible about your field and also every point of contact possible between your field and other fields and other specialties, you're going to make yourself very useful, very beneficial. Um, and, and folks that once they get to the consult side of things, for example, um, you, you can tell from somebody's, for example, consult recommendations versus another person who just uses generic terminology, generic recommendations versus somebody who is very specific and versed in lab work, comorbidities, diagnostics, all that stuff. You can tell, like, this is somebody valuable or this is somebody that, you know, eh, it's just psych. What are they, they're going to say? Just get TSH and throw on some Prozac. So it's yeah. you're really as stigmatized or as valuable as you make yourself. Right, right. How do you guys deal with physician burnout? How do you guys, as as clinicians, how do you guys kind of handle the pressures of of residency? What do you guys kind of do to to help kind of keep that balance, that work life balance alive? I hang out with you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, what, no, like, what do you guys like do? Like, do you guys like turn to somebody? Like, do you have the mentors at the program, like attendings, and like, what do you guys kind of? How do you? I think the most it? valuable tool for burnout. I mean, as much as yes, like your attendings and all that, like that's important. But I think the most valuable tools to prevent burnout are your co-residents, right? Um, your classmates, because they are going through the exact same thing you're going through. Everyone is pissed. Everyone is tired. At this point, it's the beginning of intern year, you know, for myself and Katie. I'm sure, like, at your program, you guys are probably feeling it, too. Like, you're just ready to move on, and, you know, you're tired, and you still love what you do every day, but, you know, there comes a point where you're just like, okay, like, you know, it's it's hard. And with COVID going on, there has been a huge strain on the mental health care system. We have had numbers higher than ever before because people are just having a much harder time coping with their day-to-day um, you know, and that, that, that results in higher ED uh, presentations. High, it results in higher admissions. It results in more people feeling like they just can't cope anymore. So it, it's definitely been challenging, but I think the one thing that has really helped me get through it is confiding in my colleagues and just having those vent sessions. And, like, you know, Dr. Morgan knows how much I <laughs> love being like, oh, my gosh, you know, just, like, talking it out. Um, and it, it's really helpful to just have that. Right. I think that's the number one thing that prevents it. And just making sure you keep balance in life. Right. I think that's it's um, like the little things. So where I am now, every time at like, well, it's Ramadan, so I'm fasting, so not now, but at 2 o'clock, usually we have something called like tea time. And like no matter what, like me and my co-residents, we all brought in like different kinds of teas and like we just kind of chill and like have a glass of tea, you know, and relax right. and do our patients and charts and what needs to be done. So little things like that. And also um, just my connections with my patients and gratitude that I'm able to help them, that keeps my mind off of being so tired and so worn out is like how much I love them and how much I feel like I'm able to make a difference in their lives, as corny as that sounds. But that feeling, those like personal human connections helps me prevent with burnout. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we think back, like, why did we go into medicine? Why did we go into psychiatry like what was the reason it's like to help people it's like yeah like it's tough to 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 kind of wake up those days where you're tired or the alarm goes off half an hour too early and you're just like i don't want to do this and it really gets you out of bed um i had a i had a question so about it's a very specific question it kind of made me laugh when i got it so they wrote there's a statistic that says psychiatrists have higher rates of divorce and other specialties have you guys found this to be true? Like, uh, this is an actual question somebody asked me, which is kind of interesting. Um, do you notice any, like, like relationship problems in the in, in your psychiatry programs? Or, like, do you notice that any divorce rates or anything like that along those lines? Like, do you, does anything stand out to you guys? Or so it's, you actually, it's, it's funny because tonight we have our resident activity, and we're all going axe throwing, and okay. we're – following up like who's coming and it's literally my my co-resident Jasmine was like it's going to be a septuplet I was like what and she's like it's seven couples so (laughs) it's 
So no, in my in my program, everyone is um, dating, engaged, married. Um, I think there's like happy, one person that happy. doesn't have a spouse. Everyone's happily coupled up. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. How about, how about in our you guys? program, you know, we have a good mix of people that are married, single, um, in relationships, on so all different phases. But I mean, there is no shortage of ability to pursue a relationship or maintain a relationship. <laughs> I definitely find that shocking. That that's a and my my I'm problem is to like see where they found that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, Fry has the opposite problem. He's kind of like wasp, yeah, like, like, you know, keep these women away. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, my, you, you guys know, like, I'm single my prefer- by preference, and my problem is there's not enough single people around to like, live the single lifestyle with me. Everybody's married and... Yeah, and I don't right. know. Did they get that statistic from the Onion or what? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I have no idea. I have, I have absolutely no idea. So, yeah, when I saw it, I was just like, oh, I didn't I didn't know that that was a thing. Like, I didn't know that psychiatry was any higher rate of divorce than normally. Mm-hmm. Um, but this kind of brings us almost to the end. I have one last question for you guys, um, and I kind of want each of you to, to address this individually. Um, what do you least like about being a psychiatry resident? What's the kind of the least favorable thing that you guys go through. Um, like Dr. Morgan, obviously, like you've been through four years of it, and then Dr. Fitzgerald, Dr. Gill, you guys have just, just kind of started off. So um, I can, I can least- say I think I know exactly what it is that I least like. Okay. And it is um, the limitations our healthcare system poses in terms of uh, barriers for people who are not, you know, at a socioeconomic advantage. Um, you know, it's very unfortunate that sometimes we have to discharge people to homeless shelters, and I hate that. Um, you know, people come to us at the most vulnerable times in their lives, and for me, something that I will forever have a hard time with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's as simple as that. I think that that sucks. We need more um, social services, I think, or just better support for our, you know, our communities and our populations. And we there's there's such a need in mental health and I'm hoping that this will change in the future but right now like we don't have enough you know group homes for people that have had like multiple um, suicide attempts or like are at, like very high risk and like we have a lot of patients that are placement issues and there's a lot of pressure on the system and right. it's just it's very difficult to navigate that when you truly want the best for your patients but your hands are really tied in terms of how much you can do right. yeah I'm, I was going to say very similar, Dr. Gill, um, like case management aspect of it, like trying to find placement for patients, especially our population, right? Um, our hospital deals with a lot of indigent, uh, indig- uh, they don't have like IDs, indigent, I guess you would call it, they don't have insurance, yeah. and it's impossible to get someone, like you can't even get a hotel room without a state ID. And now with COVID, all the DMVs are closed, these kind of hurdles, um, and suboxone placement. We have started patients on suboxone. No long-term rehabs want to take anyone on suboxone. I think there's one in Georgia we have that will let them go there. So these kind of limitations, lack of knowledge, even some facilities won't let them go. Like if it's um, like more faith-based, they won't let them go with even something like Prozac. They have to be off of everything. So this did public knowledge in regards to mental health as well as the resources, lack of resources. Right. I think my biggest challenge is more from a clinical practice perspective is that um, because there's not a lot of objective data and here's exactly how, here's exactly what we know about X, Y, and Z and here's exactly what to do or how to do it, it leaves a big margin of error between what is acceptable and what is just flat out wrong and honestly that that leaves too much breeding ground for mediocrity and um, subpar practice and that's not good for that's not good for patients like that's why you see a lot of people mismanaged or poorly managed on a crap ton of medications they don't like to be on or on weird doses of a lot of things that don't really make a lot of sense and unfortunately that that is acceptable once once you get out in the real world, and that that kind of takes me off. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's it's 
it's funny when you talk to different residents kind of about what they like the most or what they don't like the most, everybody has a little bit of a different answer. And I think you guys kind of gave answers that we don't normally think about or that we don't anticipate being a problem until you're actually doing it on a day-to-day. You're the one actually prescribing something. You're, you're the one that's actually calling the shots with the case managers, the social workers, with calling other hospitals to take somebody in. And I think sometimes we just don't 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 see that don't don't see that aspect of it just being a student on the on, kind of on the sidelines um that kind of just brings us to like the very end um any last advice that you guys have for future applicants into psychiatry or anybody just trying to get their foot in the door in the states or anything like that if you guys just want to say any last words about that i just want to say you know um it is an amazing time to be in the field we are at kind of like this time time where things are really changing and I feel like mental health has blown up and it's going to continue to do so. I'm hoping for lots more research into, you know, our uh, psychopathologies and to our medications in the future, kind of as Dr. Morgan was saying, I'm hoping that some of those shortcomings will be addressed and I, I think it's a really, really exciting time to be pursuing psychiatry and, you know, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to Tom and he can always forward his questions to us and just best of luck, you know, go get them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else you guys have, like Dr. Fitzgerald, no, Dr. Morgan, anything? Don't, don't don't email Dr. Morgan. He'll never email back. <laughs> he's at the beach right now. Yeah, he's at the. I, I just want to say, it, don't give up. It's hard. It's not impossible. And don't don't lose sight of, of the big picture. Don't feel that your life has to be put on hold. Don't make the mistake I made for a while. I put my entire life, my entire well-being on hold pending getting into residency. Looking back, there was, you know, I could have maybe nourished, nurtured relationships in that time with family or maybe taken better care of my health. So don't lose sight of the big picture. Yeah, it's so worth it. We have the best job in the world. My attending will say every day it's it's hard, but we have the best job in the world. That's right. That's right. So there's light at the end of the tunnel. Once you get across that that difficult yeah. bridge, there's definitely light at the end of the tunnel. Well, I want to thank you guys, all three of you, for honestly just giving us so much feedback about your your journeys in psychiatry and kind of just giving advice to future applicants. I know it's difficult, especially being IMGs, and I'm very grateful that I got three IMGs here who can actually talk about the actual experience because I feel like USMDs, USDOs don't really know the exact process and the hurdles that we crossed to get to where we're at. So I really want to thank you guys for taking this hour and a half um, on a Saturday. I know you could be out enjoying the weather or throwing more Enjoy axes. the beach. Or, yeah. Or going to the beach, exactly. So, no, I, I really want to want to thank you guys for everything. So, okay. Thanks for having us, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Tom. Yep.